Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming today. I know uh, the one L's that were here who have RWA coming up in their assignments, so your time is very precious. So uh, we appreciate you spending some time with us. <coughs> My name is Fouad Kogi. I'm the president of the Muslim Law Student Association. We're one of the student groups bringing this event together alongside the J. Reuben Clark Society, the Federalist Society, and the International and Comparative Law Society. So we have a lot of groups working together, so we're really proud to, to put this together. If you had noticed on some of the advertisements and the, uh, the pamphlets we had, or the brochures, whatever, um, we had another speaker who was supposed to be here. His name is Mr. John Khalil. He's uh, from New York. Unfortunately, as you all probably know, the Tri-State area has been devastated, storm after storm, and his flight was actually canceled as a result of the uh, recent north, uh, nor'easter going through New Jersey and New York and Connecticut. He actually, I just learned he's in Staten Island, which was one of the areas hit the worst. So all our prayers are with him and the rest of the people suffering in that area. So we're going to go ahead and get, uh, get started. We're a little late, but you know, I think we can still uh, get some good timing. Um, I'm going to introduce Professor Abbas Barzagar. He is a professor here at the Georgia State University in the Religious Studies Department. One of his areas of focus is contemporary Islamic uh, political movements. So he's going to provide a brief overview on the subject today and then introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Mohammed Fawl. So everyone, please, a round of applause for Professor Barzagar. Thank you everyone for being here, and thank you to the student organizations. I believe there are a number of them that actually went through the effort of putting this thing together. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'll tell you why in just a minute, why I jumped at the opportunity to moderate this panel and I heard Dr. Fado was coming into town. But before that, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to give quickly a backdrop, just a few minutes or so, to how important the subject of Islamic law or Sharia ethics is today in sort of international relations in domestic policy here in the United States and how that subject really has become a flashpoint of polemics and how difficult it is to actually get through the weeds of what that conversation is all about. For the majority of the 20th century, <coughs> Muslim majority societies around the world wrestled in their encounter with colonial regimes, whether they were socialist oriented or you know democratically oriented or whatever brand of colonial sort of enterprise existed in their countries, Muslim majority elites, or elites from Muslim majority societies wrestled with what the future of social organization and governance would be. As the Ottoman Caliphate broke down and sort of traditional Islamic governing structures began to break down, Muslim elites experimented in a number of different ways with Western, you know, codes of law. Some of them tried to revive you know, what they believed was a brand of Islamic, um, you know, like a pure Islamic ideal. Uh, others tried to make a, a sort of a mix between the two. But by and large, the subject of Sharia for most of the 20th century became nothing more than a symbol of, of polemics. On one side, Islamic revivalists and Muslim sort of activists used the Sharia as an ideal for the just society. You know, founders of the Islamic Brotherhood talked about the Sharia and Islam as a coherent, codified system that could work and, and kind of perfect replacement of all the other competing systems of ethics and law and governance that were out there. On the flip side, it became a symbol of how backward the Muslim world was. It struck fear in, in Western observers, you know, in the Muslim world, and they exaggerated then certain elements of uh, what might be corporal punishment in Islam and for most of the 20th century, I would argue that Sharia remained a symbol and nothing more than kind of a polemical site for both Muslim activists who revered it in an unrealistic and ideal way, and for sort of Western detractors who couldn't imagine the idea of autonomous self-governance you know, by Muslims through Islamic institutions. However, the late 20th century, and especially now in the beginning of the 21st century, with so-called Arab Spring or the democratic sort of revolts and movements that are taking over, the region, and in other places around the Muslim world, what you see is a very complicated pragmatism emerge, where one can officially speak about a kind of Islamic republicanism arising. That is, something is not fully democratic, and something is not fully theocratic. But every constitution now that you see written in Muslim-majority societies has some kind of element or some kind of provision in there that 
its source of determining law and ethics and governance procedures will be informed by the Sharia. Again, what the Sharia actually is, is a complicated question. That is complicated because the Sharia has never been a stable thing. It has always been a sort of dynamic system of ethics that has been subject to a number of debates and, you know, and, and fluctuations. There are few people that I would argue have the ability in the world today to actually get us through that complex history. Most of the stuff that is written on the Sharia that you could find through Amazon or through Google Books or on any bookshelf, even in our own libraries, talk about the Sharia and Islamic ethics still in that kind of polemical mode, either idealized or condemned. There are a few people who can understand the tradition of secular humanism well enough and the tradition of Islamic ethics well enough to be able to guide us through this conversation in this moment. One of those leaders, I believe, one of those intellectual leading figures that I, I believe that can walk us through that journey is Dr. Mohammed al Fadl, or Mohammed Fadl, excuse me. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago, which one should know if you got your PhD in Islam from the University of Chicago, that's about as good as it can ever get, okay, <laughs> in our field. All right, and he received his JD in the University of Virginia um, in 1999. Again, to have this dual training um, and this ability to work across disciplines is, um, is quite phenomenal. Today he teaches as an associate professor in the faculty of law, at the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto, where he's also a member of um, the, what is it, the uh, Department of Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations. He has written most recently on subjects like Muslim reformist, female citizenship, and public accommodation of Islam in liberal democracy, or another article that came out in 2011, Political Liberalism, Islamic Law, and Family Law Pluralism, The Contrasting Cases of New York and Ontario. I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Fadl, um, I think it was maybe in 2006 or 2007, in a, in a small workshop at Emory University, and from them, I've, since then, I've been an avid follower of his work, treating him as something of a mentor from afar, learning from him, and making sure to frequent his panel discussions and, and his speeches wherever I might run into him. So again, thank you to the panelists, and thank you to our speaker for making it here. It's an honor to be moderating this conversation. So if we could, please give a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Totally undeserved introduction. What he, I think he left out the most important part, which is that I'm a Georgia boy. Uh, okay, I guess in, in many ways. I, I, I moved here, although I was born in Egypt, we, my family moved to Georgia in 1975, and they still live you know, down the road, uh, I-20 distance to Georgia. So in many ways, I am home, and it's nice, it's always nice to come home. Um, all, my first time, though, at Georgia State, so thank you for bringing me here. Um, again, I want to express my thanks for the organizers uh, for inviting me here. And I also want to express my regret that um, the other part, the other invitee, uh, Mr. Khadid, could not make it because I was eagerly uh, awaiting uh, a chance to hear his comments and to discuss with him issues uh, in Egypt, particularly as viewed from a Coptic perspective. So, um, you know, let me say, obviously, uh, in case you didn't figure it out from my name, I am a Muslim. Right, um, and I am. I was born in Egypt, but I've lived almost the entirety of my life in the United States and now Canada, um, with the exception of two years as you know, one year after college, and then one year as a graduate student to research. And I think the the question of the Copts is is a very sensitive one for modern Egyptians. It's something that they have, particularly Egyptian Muslims. And it's very hard uh, for them to talk about it, I think, in an objective way. Same, in, from the same perspective, I think it's also very difficult for Egyptian Copts to talk about their own concerns and their own aspirations and likewise their, their grievances. I think this has to do with the kind of myth of national unity that has become, I guess, the orthodoxy of modern Egyptian nationalism. So if we want to begin understanding the dynamics of Muslim Coptic relations in Egypt today, we need to take a step back, if you, if you forgive me, maybe 150 years ago, and talk about the origins of modern Egyptian nationalism and, uh, and how this sort of myth of national unity uh, that transcends sectarian division came about. 
And basically, this is a story of modernization and the imperative of development and resisting colonialism. Um, Abbas had an occasion to mention. Uh, somebody needs to put that out. There's the, the, the burners down there. Um, so, in the beginning of the 19th century, there was a dramatic event that changed the course of Egyptian history, namely the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt. All right, first decade of the 19th century, uh, Napoleon comes, invades Egypt. And much to his surprise, and certainly the Egyptian surprise, he was able to defeat uh, the, the Egyptian rulers known as the Mamluks, who were vassals of the Ottomans, fairly easily. Right? Uh, this was sort of the first confrontation between a modern national army. Remember, the French had gone through the revolution. Uh, there was a, they had developed the new army of France. It was completely different from the revolutionary armies where you had citizens fighting. They were much more motivated than the professional mercenaries that existed before. They made short work of the Egyptian army, um, and they were quickly able to uh, occupy Egypt. Now, it didn't turn out so well for the French, sort of like when the United States went to Iraq. It was one thing to defeat the Iraqi army. It was another thing to defeat uh, irregular opposition from, from, the, from the people. And so they were, they were you know, they were, uh, subject to a guerrilla campaign for many years. While they were in Egypt, eventually the British cut off their supply lines and they had to go. It was sort of an ignominious, ended up being an ignominious defeat for Napoleon. But what it revealed was the weakness of Egyptian governing institutions, right? And that uh, Egypt, and by extension the rest of the Ottoman Empire, was extremely vulnerable to European invasion. So as a result, the new Ottoman governor that came and helped drive out uh, Napoleon, this Albanian fellow named Mahmoud Ali, right? Uh, he usually called Muhammad Ali, but he was Albanian. He wasn't Egyptian, right? He came to Egypt and he instituted a far-reaching, very wide set of reforms, which was the goal of which was to create a modern state, a modern state that would be capable of resisting armies like Napoleon's. And so the first object of reform was the army. Right? So he got rid of the kind of semi-quasi-mercenary forces that had confronted Napoleon in the United States century and did something truly revolutionary. He instituted a draft. Now, why was this revolutionary? Because in the Ottoman Empire, up until that time, there had been a rigid separation between military classes and civilian classes. Right? So there were, there were the people of the sword, and there were the people of crafts, and people of farming, et cetera, et cetera, and they should never mix. There was this idea of, of specialization, and that the policy would be corrupted if the soldiers got involved in commerce, or if commercial folks got involved in the army, right? And so the army tended to be this sort of professional class of mercenaries. Well, Muhammad Ali realized that you can't have a modern army like that, a modern army, as the French showed, depended on citizens, right? And so he instituted this draft. Now, Muhammad Ali was not some sort of deep philosophic, philosophical thinker. He was certainly not an Enlightenment political philosopher. He was not interested in abstract notions of equality. What he was interested in was institutions that worked and were effective. And he discovered that the draft was extremely effective. Right? Now, this created all sorts of dynamics for changing the mode of governance. Because until he had instituted the draft, Egyptians, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, never wore arms. The only people who, 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 who wore arms in the Ottoman Empire were Turks. Okay? Now, all of a sudden, the Arabs, right? the Arabs and the Copts, began uh, uh, serving in the army. And this created a cascade of, of, of consequences that led to the demand for much wider, broader demands, namely the Egyptianization of the state, et cetera, et cetera. It helped produce the idea of an Egyptian national community that was distinct from the Ottoman Empire as such. Okay? Because Muhammad Ali was the first sort of Ottoman governor, or at least the most successful, in implementing all these kinds of modernizing reforms. And the Ottomans sort of loved the Egyptian army. 
because they were much more efficient and effective than any other armies in the empire. And so they used to send them all over the place. Um, shockingly, a, a battalion of Egyptian troops were sent to Mexico. <laughs> right in, in, in the middle of the 19th century, when the allies of the Egyptian government, the French, sort of intervened to impose a, a sort of emperor, uh, a, a, a Habsburg emperor in Mexico, they sent Egyptians to support him. Right? So the Egyptians were sort of the crack troops of the Ottomans during the 19th century. They fought in the Crimean War. Uh, they fought in Mexico. They, there was, and, and this created a lot of resentment. Right, because Egyptians, while they were doing the fighting, they were excluded from the officer class. Right, so this helped produce the kind of um, sort of national sentiment that ended up right uh, creating the Egyptian nationalist movement. Now, as a byproduct of this, right, uh, the status of Copts in Egypt improved dramatically. Not just Copts, but Egyptian Muslims. Right, uh, because in the Ottoman Empire. Generally, the Turks <coughs> occupied uh, the highest strata of society, right? Um, and then the non-Turks, the Arabs, and then, like, at that time, they called the Muslims Arabs and they called the Christians Copts, right? uh, So the, they were just considered civilians, taxpayers, nothing else, right? um, But once they became part of the army and part of the civil bureaucracy, and began then being admitted to the officer corps and then senior levels of the bureaucracy, the status of the cops in particular right, uh, improved dramatically as compared to, let's say, the 18th century. Right? And so now there became this question of, well, what's the relationship of Egypt to the wider Islamic world? Is Egypt an exclusively national community? Right? Or is Egypt... Um, a national community that's also part of a wider Arab community and a wider Islamic community. Right? And so uh, one of the consequences then of modernization has been what does it mean to have an Egyptian national community, right? As while well, the populace of that community is made up of two very different religious communities. Right? Um, now, I would, I'm not a cop, but I, you know, and so I hesitate to speak a little bit about the Coptic Church. But the Coptic Church, as far as I can tell, is, is very interesting and unique in many ways, especially among the churches in the Middle East. Because unlike, say, churches in Syria, Palestine, and Iran, <coughs> the Egyptian church is in many ways a national church. Right? Coptic is the Greek word for Egypt. Um, and so there's a kind of in incipient nationalism that is inherent in the idea of the Coptic church itself, which you don't find in other Middle Eastern churches. Okay? So um, whereas in places like Syria and Palestine, Arab nationalism, for example, might work as an ideology that could transcend religion, right? because we're all Arabs, whether we're Christian Arabs or Muslim Arabs, we're still all Arabs. It doesn't work out the same way for the Copts, because the Copts have a much stronger identity of being Egyptian. Okay? Um, in fact, Coptic continued to be a spoken language until the 16th or 17th century. So it's only fairly recently that Coptic ceased being spoken as a language in Egypt. Right? Um, and there's still lots of Coptic words, obviously, in the vernacular Arabic. Um, lots of people uh, use the Coptic calendar, right? because the Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar, so it's not very practical for an agricultural society like Egypt. So in the countryside, people continue to use the names of Coptic months uh, for you know, their, their, their daily activities. Right? So um, the problem then of the identity of Egypt is essentially, from my perspective, is Egypt um, a, a, a exclusively national Egyptian community, right, whose roots are fundamentally pre-Islamic, right, going back to the pharaohs, and essentially uh, born and, and, and represented, represented, one could say most authentically, by the Coptic Church, right? Uh, the Coptic Church preserves the Coptic language, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's a very unique, its own unique religious, religious rituals, right? I mean, it considers itself the one true church, Right? 
Uh, or did something radically happen to Egypt when uh, the Arabs came in the seventh century? Right? Now, of course, that's the view of the, ge the, the, the general view of the Muslim communities that Egypt radically changed, right? Unlike uh, the Romans and the Greeks, right? The Egyptian people abandoned their religion and abandoned their language and adopted the language and religion of the newcomers, something that didn't happen during the Greek occupation and the Roman occupation. If anybody here knows a little bit about Egyptian history, right, the last truly independent Egyptian dynasty, I think was, I don't know, 27th or 25th, the, the last dynasty, the 30th dynasty, was a Greek dynasty. Cleopatra was Greek, right? But yet, their influence on Egyptian civilization was pretty superficial. If you go to Egypt, you'll find lots of temples that the Ptolemies built, but they're all in the style of what we identify as Egyptian. Right? Egypt didn't pick up, Egyptians didn't begin speaking Greek. Same thing, after the Romans conquered Egypt and were incorporated in the Roman Empire. Right? Certainly the elites were part of the Hellenistic Latin culture, but the Egyptian people themselves didn't adopt Latin or didn't become speakers of some sort of Romance language, right? They continued speaking Coptic. Okay? Um, and then when the Roman Empire adopted Christianity, right, the Egyptians didn't follow the Greek church. They kept their own church, the Coptic church, right? Um, and so, in a really radical respect, a very important respect, Islam did represent something dramatically different in Egyptian history than either the Greeks or the Romans because for the first time it actually uh, had dramatic influence on the character of the country beyond simply the ruling elite. Now this didn't happen overnight. Right? It took a very long time before Muslims and Arabic became the majority language and religion. I think even as far as the Crusades, Crusades going on in the 12th and 13th centuries, right? a majority of Egypt, particularly the countryside, would have been Christian. Right? And in fact, I think a lot of historians would say it was the experience of the Crusades that put a, that made um, the Muslim elites, who were again centered primarily on Cairo and Alexandria, uh, begin a campaign, a overt campaign of Islamizing the countryside because they thought it was quite dangerous to be exposed to the Christian invasion and have most of the population Christians. But in any case, um, Islam changed Egyptian culture in a way that was unprecedented, right? And so now we have this kind of difficult relationship where we're trying to build a national community on what the role of Islam should be, what the role of Christianity which should be, what kind of political community it should be. And this, this comes out in many, many sectors. One, of course, is what's known as Article II of the Egyptian Constitution. Article 2 of the Egyptian Constitution declares that Arabic is the official language of the state and Islam is the religion of the... Arabic is the official language, Islam is the religion of the state, and the Sharia, Islamic law, is the principal source of legislation. Okay? Um, now, the cops particularly object to the last one. But they also object to the other two as well. Right? Uh, because in some ways, I mean, one could say it subordinates uh, the Coptic memory of what Egypt is, right? Because in, so, in, in certain respects, they don't think Arabic is their own language, even though they speak it now, right? It's not, they think that Coptic is their language. And certainly Islam isn't their religion, it's, it's religion of their majority, but it's not their religion. So there's a, there's a kind of alienation, uh, I think, that's built into the Constitution that's been there since Egypt became independent. In 1923, the very first Egyptian constitution also declared Islam to be the state religion. I don't know if it said that Arabic was the official language. It certainly didn't say that Islamic law was the, um, the principal source of legislation. Right? Uh, but in, in any case, uh, the reality was, even if you go back to the first quarter of the 20th century, Islamic law was, for all intents and purposes, the common law of Egypt. Okay. The way Islamic law worked was that, as a general rule, non-Muslims were not subject to anything 
that was sort of religious about Islamic law. So Islamic law covers, begins with discussions about religious obligations, like how you pray, fasting, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these religious obligations, right? And then, after they conclude discussing those, they then get into what we would call sort of contracts, family law, civil obligations generally. So as a general rule, Muslim jurists held that non-Muslims were exempt from anything having to do with religion. But they were bound, to the same extent as Muslims, with respect to other areas of the law. The theory being that there's nothing religious about contract law, about torts, about criminal law, et cetera, et cetera. So they could have no religious objections to following those rules. So as, as a result, right, um, the kinds of values, ideals, norms, implicit in Islamic law, have shaped Egyptian society generally, Muslims and Christians. Okay? Um, and so, as a practical matter, Egyptian law, even after independence, and even though uh, it did not state, the Constitution did not state that Islam was the principal source of legislation, um, the historical legacy of Islam in Egypt meant that Islamic law was going to have this sort of role only as a result of of inertia, right? Now, Abbas had mentioned uh, Muslim rulers in the 19th century experimenting with various modes of Western governance. <coughs> One important way that they did was by importing European law codes. Okay? So Egypt was one of the earliest Muslim states to do so. They adopted the Napoleonic Code, I think in 1881 or 1882. But it's very important to understand the motives of the Egyptian state for doing so. They did not do so as part of a secularizing uh, move, right? It was not part of a claim that now Egypt is going to be a secular state in the sense that religion is not a part of the governing constitution. Because they were also considering adopting a new Islamic code that had been in the process of being drafted. But, at least according to some of the leading scholars in this area, the reason why they opted for the Napoleonic Code was that it had the virtue of being available. It was there. And the British were coming. Okay? <laughs> the British were coming, literally. The British were coming. Um, they were about to invade and occupy Egypt. right? And the Egyptian government wanted to act in anticipation of loss of control by um, insulating the legal system and preserving some measure of legal independence, right? So they thought if they adopted the French civil code, that would remove one excuse for the British to interfere in the Egyptian legal system. Because if it had continued to be an Islamic system, the British would say, oh, this is uncivilized, we have a right to intervene, right? But if it's a French system, they would be much more reticent to do so. And in fact, that's what happened. Okay? But it was not a secularizing move. It was not like Ataturk. I don't know if anybody here knows who Ataturk is, but he was the, the founder of the Turkish Republic. Ataturk, at the end of World War I, made a very conscious, explicit decision to completely cut all legal and political and constitutional roots uh, uh, of, the, of, of, of uh, the Ottoman Empire from the Turkish Republic. So he banned, essentially, Islam from the public sphere. That's not what happened in Egypt, or for that matter, the rest of the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire. Instead, what happened was um, the adoption of what I would call reformist Islam. So what we would do, you know, assuming I'm a 19th century ruling elite in Egypt, is that we are going to be reforming Islamic law for purposes of our modernization project. Now, why were they doing this? Again, because the problem in their mind with traditional Islamic law was that it was completely useless for modernizing the state. Okay? It was, in other words, it was a cause of relative backwardness and underdevelopment. So they viewed the law as a tool for social modernization. <coughs> and they viewed codified law as a particularly effective <coughs> tool of modernization. Because it would be clear, and it would be easy to administer, and they could hold judges accountable to it. Islamic law is very much like a common law. 
It's based on opinions of jurists, right? A lot of differences of opinion, okay? And lots of power in the individual judges. Well, that kind of judicial system is not very helpful to a state that's seeking to modernize and transform society. Okay? So they adopted codified law and they attempted to reform traditional Islamic law, not on a theory of secularization or not based out of um, liberal principles of equality, but rather what uh, perceived needs of modernization and development. Now it just so happened that the needs of modernization and development often overlapped with liberal demands for equal treatment. Because it turns out that um, if you want to get people to do to be more efficient and more productive, uh, if you treat them equally and you give them a stake in it, they tend to do they, they tend to work harder and be more productive. Right? So hierarchical societies tend to be really quite bad at development. Okay? Uh, regardless of, of any kind of liberal norms of equality. So um, this, is, this is, I think, the, the dilemma that we have in a place like Egypt, is that we have legal, we have our, and if you look at the foundational documents of the Egyptian Republic, going back to the 1920, well, it wasn't a republic in 1923, it was a constitutional monarchy. But if you look at the three constitutions, 1923, 1971, 1980, and now this fourth one, you have a conflict between what I would call rational secularity and uh, religious secularity. Now that might seem paradoxical to you, religious secularity, what does that mean? Well, what it means is a kind of commitment to secular rationality that is subject to certain limitations imposed by religion. Okay? So if there is a conflict between the demands of Secular rationality and religious, or and religious, uh, excuse me, secular rationality and religious uh, rationality. The religious uh, view trumps or controls, okay? Because at the end of the day, at least according to um, the Egyptian constitution, but also by most Egyptian intellectuals, Egypt still continues to be first and foremost a Muslim Arab community, right? And um, what's changed in the course of modernization is the determination to include Copts as equal members politically as the, of that community uh, relative to traditional Islamic law, which had imposed lots of disabilities on Copts. So there were subjects, particular regimes of, regime of taxation, there were particular regimes regarding their right to give evidence in court, etc., etc. So. Um, Islamic modernism removes all those disabilities so that they have the same rights and privileges as Muslims under Islamic law. But the state is still conceived as a religious community. Right? And so I think this is, this is the kind of tension is that um, the, Muslim, the Muslims of Egypt want to, want to preserve the character of Egypt as an Arab Muslim state. Right? Um, and, they, and recognizing that this might alienate the Copts. They want to offer, make sure that there's no discrimination in law, but the Copts want to say, well, that's not good enough because we don't think, just by simply declaring Egypt to be Arab Muslim, that automatically puts us in a status of inferiority, right? Regardless of whether or not the actual law uh, does not treat us differently. It states that Islam is a preferred position to Christianity, and so that in, in and of itself leads to some sort of at least moral or symbolic subordination. Um, now one thing I think it's also very important to understand here, uh, the Egyptian law in general does not make any <coughs> distinctions based on religion, as I said. So there's not a separate legal system for Copts and Muslims. Right? Uh, in many cases, values from Islam sort of animate the substantive values of the law, but I don't think, as far as I know, that there are particular um, objections to the substantive values of the law. There's one area in law, however, where there is, there are facial religious distinctions, and that's family law. Okay. So in Egypt, family law depends exclusively, or depends uh, fundamentally on your religious status. So you cannot be non-religious in Egypt. 
at least for purposes of the law. Every single Egyptian citizen must either be a Muslim, Christian, or Jew. Okay? Because those are the only kinds of family laws that exist. And if you're not a member of those three communities, you simply have no standing under family law. Right? So if you want to have some sort of access to a court to litigate something in family law, you have to declare your membership in one of these three religions. Right? And there are, in, in this area, there are wildly different rights and obligations. Okay? Because Islamic family law is very different than Coptic family law. Most prominently, the right of divorce. The, Cop the Coptic church does not recognize divorce. Okay? Um, and so this creates a lot of problems, or it's often the catalyst for sectarianism in Egypt. Because some people in the Coptic church might want to get out of a marriage. They can't get out of the marriage because the church won't let them, so they convert to Islam. Right? By converting to Islam, they have all the rights of a Muslim. They can get divorced right away. Right? Now, of course, this creates communal tension. Okay? Um, it's not one, one might think the easy solution is why not just have a civil family code right, that doesn't depend on religion? Well, again, it's not that easy. Because, um, first of all, in practical terms, if there were such a civil code, the substantive provisions of it would most likely reflect the preferences of Muslims. For example, it's certainly going to allow divorce. Right? And it's inconceivable that Egypt would have a civil family code that didn't allow divorce. Right? So that's not going to exactly please the Coptic Church, right? which is still a, a very powerful institution. Um, and so lots of the actually daily problems are triggered by uh, intimate matters in family law. Right? Whether if there's a if there's an abused wife in the Coptic Church and she wants to get divorced and she can't, so she converts to Islam, or vice versa, a man wants to get out of a marriage and can't, so he converts to Islam. Another circumstance also is interreligious affairs. Right? In those situations, again, there's there's a practical incentive to convert, and that can lead to, to lots of problems. The other the other flashpoint for intercommunal tensions course, is um, building of places of worship. So in Egypt, it's a lot easier for Muslims to build a mosque than it is for Christians to build a church. Christians have to go through a special bureaucratic procedure to build a church. And one of the main demands of the Coptic community, supported by the revolutionaries, is that there should be one unified law for the construction of religious buildings in Egypt that applies to everybody. Finally, a bit about the robotic regime. I know I'm taking up too much time, but I want to say this. Because we're lawyers here, we are very interested not only in history, but also in institutions of governance. Um, again, one of the problems that led to the Egyptian revolution uh, was the fact that the Egyptian state under Mubarak had really ceased to be a state of law. Instead, Mubarak tended to rule by creating um, entering into side deals, essentially, with powerful constituencies. Right? And so he would agree, for example, with the Muslim Brotherhood, even though you're illegal, we'll allow you to do X, Y, and Z, but don't ever think about doing A. Right? Same thing, he entered into side deals with the Coptic Church. So he would give the Coptic Church a lot of privileges, freedoms, rights to do all sorts of things, even if it was outside the framework of law but on condition that they didn't do X, X, Y, and Z, right? So for example, when we talk about uh, the right to build a church, uh, Pope, the late Pope Shenouda, for example, was given the exclusive right by Jose Mubarak to distribute build church building permits. Now the, the Pope was really keen on that right, right? Because it gave him a lot of leverage over the Christian community, okay? So, um, Part of the issues facing the Coptic Church right now are not just its relationship with the Muslim community and, and uh, to what extent they can, they can accept an Islamic identity or an Arab identity of the state, but also what's their relationship to the church? Because the church is extremely powerful over the lives of the Christians. Right? Um, like I said, you can't get a divorce if you're a Christian in Egypt, and a lot of Christians really resent that. Right? Um, and so uh, 
to what extent will the future Egyptian government be able to regulate not just Islam, but also the Coptic Church through law, as opposed to informal personal mechanisms that tended to aggrandize the power of these institutions, religious institutions. So that's, these are all unanswered questions. I was supposed to predict what's going to happen. I really have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> right? Egypt faces a huge amount of challenges. Um, and I actually think that uh, these kinds of problems can only really be solved if you solve uh, the daily problems that people face. Right? If people have economic growth, if they have jobs, if they have schools, um, if they can solve those kinds of problems, it will be surprising how quickly these identity problems melt away. I mean, I, I want to conclude with just a, a shout, a, 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 you know, pointing out that an earlier time in America, we were not free of sectarian trouble. Have any of you ever been, I mean, I'm sure many of you have been to Washington, D.C.? Been to the Washington Monument? You ever notice that the Washington Monument is built with different colored bricks? Has anybody ever noticed that? If anybody has any Google, image, you know, does anybody know why there are different colored bricks in the Washington Monument? Just stupidity? <laughs> because of Protestant Christian riots that put a stop to the building of the Washington Monument. Right? And when they started again, the original color bricks weren't around. So it's a, it's a big mistake, I think, to look at where countries that have been living under democracy for 200 years or more are with respect to religious harmony, and then expect a country that's just starting to be at the same spot. So I'll conclude there. Thank you. Thank you.